Hey everybody, this is Craig Cottle, the director of Nature Alliance School, and we are here today with Jim Harrison, the director of the Kentucky Reptile Zoo, to talk about snakes. So the first thing I want to ask you about, Jim, is uh, a lot of folks in the survival community carry around with them a small snake bite kit that has the extraction device, and mm -hmm. man, some of them I've seen even have a razor blade in them to right. make the X cuts. and. So can you speak to those kits and what your thoughts are on those? Well, first, you know, the, 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 all of the snake bite kits that are out there, the Sawyer extractor and the old um, little Boy Scout kit that had the, the uh, scalpel and the constriction band are now, um, all the snake bite experts say, do not use them. Um, the fact is snake venom, the way it, it evolved, snake venom has a spreading factor in it and a bonding factor. And as soon as a snake bites you, the venom is bonded, it's already starting to spread, you can't suck it out with a cheap little suction cup. Uh, Dr. Um, Hardy and Dr. Sean Bush, who used to be on Venom One, uh, did a paper debunking the uh, uh, ex Sawyer extractor and just basically says the extractor sucks. Yeah. And that's exactly what it says. And, and you know, you're delaying time. When you're sitting there and you're messing with this first aid kit that doesn't work, you're delaying time, and time is the most important thing about getting to um, anti-serum, which is the only treatment for snake bite. Um, you know, people over the years have had stuff like chicken liver, they'll put kerosene on the bite, and these are all things that because kerosene. of the... Yeah, oh. yeah, they think it draws out the venom. Okay. And basically, the reason to get all this is that person survives. Well, most snake bites are survivable without any treatment. You know, the snakes control how much venom they give, and most snake bites range from being a dry bite to only about 5% of the bites we see are lethal. So, so when you say dry bite, I'm assuming you mean they... they don't they, inject venom. They don't put the venom in it, but right. they get a hold of you. Yeah, they bite you, and snakes get, like, you know, we're not prey, we're not food, and it takes a lot of energy from a biological standpoint for them to produce the venom. So for them to waste it on an item that they're not going to eat is, you know, wasteful. I mean, it, it hurts them biologically. So when you get bitten by a snake, you have a very good chance, unless you've really harassed the snake. If you just suddenly startle a snake, it turns around and bites you, you have a good chance of having a, you know, a dry bite where it does not give any venom at all. Now, another myth that, that goes around about snakes is that juveniles can't control their venom, and, and that's why they, you know, they're more dangerous than adults. It's not true. Um, we have done studies that show that the babies control their venom. There is a difference in the venom between a baby and an adult because they eat a different prey item. So at about one year old, they change the uh, composition of their venom. Hmm. They're not more dangerous. Now, sometimes when we've done studies, the juveniles have been more toxic. But their venom apparatus for injecting venom is smaller. Uh, they don't give as much venom, so they're not really more dangerous. They're just, it's just different. So mm -hmm. people have taken a little sound bite and turned it into a, a major yeah. thing. Just like with the snake bite kids, you know, I have a lot of people that argue with me all the time about, oh, well, my uncle used it and he survived. Well, he would have survived no matter what you did. You know, you could take right. a dead chicken and swing it over the top of your head, you still would have survived. <laughs> you know, and, uh, the thing with the kerosene is it's very popular actually in eastern Kentucky and it's also popular in some of the countries I've traveled overseas and what they'll do is they'll put it on the bite and they'll see something come to the top of the kerosene so they think that's the venom being drawn out. Now I've had people argue with me when they put the suction cup on they see something that's you know amber color comes up. Well actually as soon as the venom touches the blood it's not amber anymore. It bonds with the blood and it's actually a darker color of blood. So what you're pulling out is just the normal serology of, a, of a, a wound. If you've seen a wound where you see a little bit of amber or light colored t uh, fluid coming out, that's what you're getting. You're not getting any venom out when you do that. So, you know, we suggest, you know, and this is pretty simplistic, is, you know, the only first aid for snake bite is a set of car keys. Get the person to the hospital as quickly as possible. If you're out and you're in a a, a distant area, a distant area, or something like that, and you can't get to a car, you know, then you're you're going to have to ride it out. There's nothing else. So you is can it really better do. in that situation? You're in a remote situation to sit and wait until help gets you, yes. or should you walk out? You can walk out, counting on where the bite is. If it's not, if you, you know, you're not going to speed it up so fast. It travels through the limb system, um, unless you put yourself into shock, which is very, 
you know, common when people are bitten by snakes. Shock can be caused by a psychological reaction to the bite, or it can be a physiological when the blood, you know, when you start having blood drops and your clotting factors and stuff like that, you can go into shock. So it, it's, it just counts on where you're bitten and, and how calm you are. I always suggest that you walk slowly out, or if, if, if the person has a second person with them and they're bitten in a leg, uh, that they, you know, somebody takes, makes a little, um, um, thing to pull them out, you know, mm. I forget what they're called, a litter, litter. litter. Yeah, yeah, litter, yeah. and just pull them out, of, you know, and take them to the hospital. Um, you know, if they're bitten on the arm or something like that, you want to keep the hand slightly elevated above, above heart level, um, you know, it is going to be intense pain. You'll know if you had a dry bite within 10 minutes of being en envenomated because you'll feel a burning sensation at the side of the bite. I mean, you've if got you're some. Envenomated. If you're envenomated, if the venom is injected, you'll feel a burning sensation in the side of the bite, and with the amount of venom, that will increase with the, how much pain there is and how much swelling. Um, typically, you know, if you have swelling past the bite site, maybe six to seven inches, uh, 20 minutes post bite, you probably got a pretty serious bite. Um, with copperhead bites, we've never had a death in the state of Kentucky from a copperhead bite. Um, the only copperhead bite deaths that we have documented in the last 30 years have been re allergic reactions to the bite. Um, I, I consulted on an autopsy on a gentleman who died in Tennessee who was keeping one as a pet illegally and was bitten and he started breaking out on hives, he started wheezing, he had pinpoint pupils. Mm. Classic uh, anaphylactic reaction. And when he had that reaction, his family was trying to hide all the snakes that he had illegally no and way. not call an EMS, so he died. He probably would have died anyway because it's hard to, to uh, treat a person who's having anaphylaxia if it takes any amount of time, any delay in, in time. I keep an epinephrine shot around with me just because I've been exposed to the venom. Typically people who have never been exposed to the venom will not have an allergic reaction the first time they're exposed to it. But there is some talk of an anaphylactoid which is, instead of being an anaphylactic reaction, an anaphylactoid means they don't believe you've ever been exposed to the venom and your first exposure you have an allergic reaction. Mm. That one's kind of hard to, to tell because there's similar proteins that are in bee venoms and wasp venoms, so most people have been exposed to some degree. Um, Excellent. And so, the, the SARS uh, constriction band and stuff, that is also not um, recommended because no, no tourniquet. Even if they call it a rotating constriction band, most people don't know how to do a rotating constriction band. It becomes a tourniquet, um, and it doesn't really slow the venom down. It makes it go deeper in the tissue and cause more necrosis or death of tissue. Same thing is true about ice. Um, you know, ice causes vasal constriction initially, and then it causes vasal dilation, where it'll make it spread quicker. So ice is not recommended either. You know. Set of car keys, so basically get them out all the things that people think they should be doing mm -hmm. for snake bites, mm -hmm. uh, you don't do. And that's right. why I wanted to get you on, right. on here with us. So. Well, the, 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 the part of that fear is that people think they have to do something. And in first aid, the, the first thing I teach you is first you do no harm. Mm -hmm. And all these things are causing more harm. So you just need to get the person out calmly and you know, trying to reassure them that you know, they're, they're going to do fine. I mean, if you get to medical treatment within four to eight hours of most of the snake bites, you will survive the bite. 99.9% .9 of the people in the United States. Now, as far as you know, saving the limb or saving the area that was bitten, having necrosis, um, what you see is what you get. Even if I had anti serum and gave it immediately to you on the spot when you were bitten, I'm not going to be able to reverse site necrosis. I may be able to keep some of the necrosis from spreading, but where the venom has actually gone in, there's enzymes that start necrosis and those enzymes are not neutralized by anti-serum. So it's there, there's nothing yep. to do about it. I've actually, went on a couple of my bites, I've had anti-serum in myself within 15 minutes, which is about as fast as you can get it, because you have to get the IV started and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I still had necrosis, so it's wow. just not, it's just, you so know. So what should we communicate when we get to a medical professional? Is it important that they know what snake bit us? It, it, it helps to know if it's a, a rattlesnake or a copperhead in this area. Um, the reason it isn't as big of a, uh, an issue as most people try to make it out to be is because there's only one anti-serum. It's a polyvalent that covers all the pit vipers. So in our area, the only thing we have are pit vipers. Okay. So if you're bitten, um, you, just, you, know, you just need to get to the hospital. 
you know, if you could tell them it's a rattlesnake, then they're going to approach it. Most doctors who know anything about snake bite are going to approach it a little more aggressively than they would if it was a copperhead. Because, like I said, copperhead bites are not typically life threatening. And on most copperhead bites, we only use uh, supportive care. We don't even give anti serum for. Um, anti serum is extremely expensive. And being a medicine, there's always a chance of side effect. But if you were bitten by a timber rattlesnake and you have really bad swelling and ecchymosis, the discoloration of the skin real quickly, we're going to want to get anti serum in you quickly because that's an indication. You know, the other thing is, like I was talking about, we had a timber bite not too long ago. You know, I'll ask people certain questions, and I, I, never, I never ask them, like, and, and I lead, I give them kind of a, not a leading question. I just say something like, how's your mouth feel? And if they say they have a metallic taste in their mouth, that indicates that it's a severe envenomation. They've already gone systemic. Now, if I'd have said, oh, do you have a metallic taste in your mouth? I just planted that in their mind, sure. and they're going to start thinking it. So you don't give them any, any uh, references. You just kind of let them tell you what the symptoms are and stuff. Right. And just you know, talk to the person, keep them calm, and, and get them out. Um, like I said, we, you know. How do, how, do we, how do we go about avoiding snakes? I mean, where the, the where best, do snakes lay? Yeah, how do we stay away from the them? The best thing to do when you're out in, the, in, in their neighborhood, uh, you're visiting their home, you've got to kind of treat it with respect of any animal. And the best way to avoid an interaction with a venomous snake is to watch where you put your hands and feet. Don't stick them in dark areas. Snakes are pretty secretive. They, they set up a spot. And rattlesnakes and copperheads are ambush predators. So they'll have like an area where they sit and they watch for food. And when we hunt them, sometimes we look for food trails. You know, you'll see where road trails are through the, the grass and stuff. And you can follow that and you'll sit there and see, see them with their heads perched up waiting for food to come along. So when you're out walking along, you just need to make sure you don't walk in high weeds without having some visibility where you're putting your feet. Um, wear sturdy clothing. I mean, wear sturdy shoes, hiking boots, something. Because there was a study that uh, was done at Loma Linda University where it showed even wearing jeans, um, when there was a bite, the 65% of the venom was deposited in the jeans. Hmm. So as soon as they hit something, they start to inject. So. If that, if that venom is on the gene and then it makes skin contact. It's not going to have an effect. Nothing. It has okay. to it has to be introduced into a wound and it has to be introduced into the limb system. Um, you know, for us, we try to avoid even getting the venom on our, our skin because of the pores and stuff. And for, the reason that is, is that it intensifies the uh, possibility that you're going to have an allergic reaction because you're exposing yourself. But if you're just a hiker, you know, your only exposure is going to probably be this, it's not going to have any effect on you. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, laying next to the log, that's a lot of people mm -hmm. when you're yep. walking over a log. When you're walking over a log. You know, there, there's a mythology that always bites the second person that steps over the log. It's, that actually is a myth that has maybe a little bit of truth because the first person steps over antagonizes him. The second person that steps over is right there, and, and he feels... Uh, danger for his life and he, he strikes. So, you know, you always should look before you step over, step up on the log, look down, then step back off of it. Um, you know, it's amazing down here we don't see that many bites and there are, there are a lot of copperheads here and, and um, we have a lot of rock climbers and I've only seen one or two rock climbers ever bitten and it was never while they were rock climbing. <laughs> one guy was bitten last year when we had a real warm winter and he was out walking around barefoot in February around his campsite and he stepped on them because he never expected one to be out in February. Well, if you have warm weather, they come out, you know, so you, you got to be aware of your environment. You know, that's going to play a big uh, uh, thing in it is what time of year you're out and everything, whether animals are active or not. But you just should be always aware of your environment. I mean, people fall off cliffs down here all the time because they don't pay attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. So. So it sounds like the key is uh, leave them alone. That's mm -hmm. something at National yep. School we talk about all the time. Leave wildlife yep. alone. Let yep. it do its thing. Yeah, if you see a snake, just go the opposite direction. You don't need to come in contact with it. Um, you know, last year Kristen spoke at the snake bite conference in Hawaii, and one of the speakers there was doing a statistical uh, thing about the snake bites in the United States. And it used to be 65% of the bites were to the lower limb. Now it's 90% of the bites to the hand. And we can equate that's that. Pick, pick them up? Yeah. yeah. 
trying to imitate what they see on TV. Oh, uh, it's wow. kind of a you know monkey see, monkey do type thing. Yeah. So Jim, it sounds like the answer is to, uh, for the most part, just simply avoid them. And that's something we talk about at Nature Line School all the time is, is uh, unless it's a food source that you've got to have, right. you're going to die and you right. need a food source. But right. we do everything that we can to leave wildlife alone whenever we can. Well, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you don't want to intend, you know, take a chance of making things worse by getting yourself bitten by trying to catch a venomous snake for food, unless you absolutely have to. Um, you know, the way, the best way to avoid snake bite is, is is to leave the snake alone. And we tell people if you see the snake, you just back off. You know, in a general rule, snakes can only strike about, you know, half their body length, and you know, some species overseas can strike two thirds of their body length. But you can walk fast enough away from that that it, it's not going to be a problem. So, you know, if you're out in the woods, just be aware of your environment. I mean, you're, you're in their home, treat it with respect. You know, I had somebody once tell me that, you know, nature's like a house. You build a house, you put a foundation down to it. If you chip away at the foundation, the house falls in on top of you. So if you're taking items that you don't need you, or, or messing with something you don't need to be messing with, you're just kind of chipping away at your home. You're taking away your safety valve. So, you know, if you're out walking, um, always be aware where you put your hands and feet. Don't step over logs, step up on top of the log, look first, then step off the log. Don't get tunnel vision. Don't be watching a bird over there. And then, you know, same thing can happen with a cliff. You step the wrong direction. You pay attention to your environment and you won't have a problem. Um, most of the snake bites that we see are people in intentionally interacting with the snake. Um, we can equate that to, you know, YouTube and TV and people imitating what they see on TV. And, you know, the guys that are on TV, for the most part, are not experts. They're showmen. So they want to pick the snake they're up. And, yeah, they're entertainers. And they're showing kind of a reckless, uh, you know, handling thing. Um, I never pin a snake unless I'm extracting venom. I never put my hand on them. You know, there's tools for doing it. You know, if you have a snake around your house and you want to remove the snake, Take a trash can, put it down sideways, take a broom, sweep it up into it, flip the uh, trash can back up, put the lid on it, take them out and dump them somewhere. You know, typically you don't want to go more than a mile, mile and a half away from where the animal is because they have a home range. And so that's enough to get, keep them probably from coming back to your house mm -hmm. because that's a bad interaction for them. That's, you know, scares them that you put them in the trash can and stuff. So a lot of times they will not come back to that same spot. Um, you know, if you're out walking, there's high weeds and you have to go through the weeds. Make sure you're wearing appropriate footwear, you know, boots, um, jeans, things to protect yourself, even just from the weeds themselves. Um, you know, uh, at Loma Linda University did a study where they saw that 65% uh, of the venom was deposited in the jeans when the person was, was wearing jeans and the snake bit. So anything gives you a little bit extra protection so you know right. put a barrier between you and them and the best barrier is your mind use your mind and stay away from the snake and you know males tend to get bit more than females because the ego, ego yeah. showing off and you know a lot of times alcohol is involved so <laughs> yeah. uh, all things that you shouldn't be doing anyway if you're trying to survive so right what uh, any other while we're here mm -hmm. and it seems like we've covered actual snake bites and mm -hmm. venomation stuff of that nature any other myths about snakes that you'd like to pass out to our viewers? Well, the, the, the biggest myth that I hear all the time is aggression. They always are talking about snakes are aggressive, snakes are aggressive. My idea of aggression would be that if I'm walking in the woods and I'm walking down a path and the snake comes charging out of the hills and attacks me, that's aggression. If I step on him and he bites me, that's self-defense. Mm -hmm. So they're defensive animals. and. Like I said earlier, they don't want to use their venom. It's too hard on them to, to make that venom up. So they're not going to waste it on us. And, you know, I tell little kids all the time, even the biggest snake in the world, you're a giant because you're standing erect. So just leave them alone. They don't have arms to push you away, so they can't push you away. The only way they have to defend themselves is to bite. So um, the other myth is that if a snake rouses its tail and there's a rattle, noise that it's venomous because there's a lot of harmless snakes like rat snakes and uh, milk snakes and king snakes will rattle their tails and vibrate them in the leaves. So that does not mean they're a rattlesnake. A yep. So people start freaking out. It's a, you know, I actually had a guy years ago that I did an autopsy on who they wanted me to identify the snake and I got there and there was a garter snake that was chopped in like four or five pieces. And what had happened was the guy had a pre-existing heart condition and this just sent him over the edge because he was scared of snakes. He was convinced that he was going to die. You know, it's a lot of 
it is mindset. I mean, when I, when I used to train uh, anti-terrorist and SWAT people, I used to tell them, I said, you're not dead till you're dead. You know, just because you got shot, because there were people who got shot in the shoulder, it was not life-threatening, would die. Right. You know, it's a psychological thing. You just keep shooting till you can't shoot no more. And right. same thing with the snake bite. When you're bitch, you just don't lay down and die. You just kind of start thinking of what you need to do to get out of this situation, how to survive. You know, I, people always comment on how calm I stay. And, you know, I tell people, I say, well, acting crazy isn't going to make me live any better. It's actually going to make it harder for me to survive. Right. So in any situation, the calmer you stay, keep your blood pressure down, keep your mind set right, and you just go into survival mode, you have a better chance of survival. Very good. Um, anything else you want to share about snakes? I mean, uh, one of the things I, I would like for our viewers to know, that John, is that thing not doing it again? I can't see it. Um, yeah, it's moving. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I see something moving. So. All right, so sorry about that. That's okay. Um, snakes provide a valuable service to the outdoors. Right. I mean, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I see, I've seen two people on Facebook in the last week that have killed uh, rat snakes in mm -hmm. their backyard. And I'm thinking, do you like mice? Right. Uh, you must because you're killing the thing that's taking care of them. Well, actually, the one thing that people don't understand is that delicate balance of nature. We've kind of, you know, which is kind of what scares me with people getting so caught up in the Internet and caught up on just being inside all the time. They've lost that little bit of connection they have with nature. Mm -hmm. And even with the TV show, they're living vicariously through these guys who don't really know what they're doing on TV. And so they, they've lost that, that connection. And I'm, I'm afraid for kids because they're losing that connection. If you don't respect something and know that it has a place, then you don't care if it's gone. Right. And, you know, all those little keys, all those little things, like, um, they keep us alive. I mean, the snakes control rodents. They control insects. There's snakes that eat insects. Actually, uh, the green snake that's around here can, and, you know, even garter snakes eat insects. Green snakes will eat mosquitoes. So you're, you're talking an animal that's helping control West Nile disease. Uh, and, you know, people are killing them because they're afraid of them. The other is, is that rodents carry diseases that kill humans. In the United States each year, we have zero to 12 people die from snake bite. Um, and like I said earlier, most people survive snake bites. So the only people who typically die from snake bite are people who refuse medical treatment or delay medical treatment. Um, so, you know, you have an animal that controls the diseases that rodents carry, like the Hunta virus, and, you know, every year we have 75 people or more die from the Hunta virus in the United States. I think a couple, was it last year or the year before last, out in one of the national parks, they had oh, a yeah, big right, right. outbreak of Hunta virus. In Yellowstone, I yep, yeah. and that's because people have interfered with that balance of nature. So you, you need to realize that it's part of nature, and then if you like eating, I mean, if you want crops, you have to control the rodents. I mean, you know, you start wiping them out, you, the snakes and the hawks and everything that are, that are balanced there, you, you know, and, and people say, oh, I got a cat. Well, your cat can't crawl on the wall and eat a whole family of rodents, which is what a snake can do. Uh, the other thing is, is with like the black snakes, the old timers used to have a good saying of, you know, don't kill any black snakes because they, they keep the venomous snakes away. Well, the black king snake will eat copperheads and copperheads and rouse snakes know this. So if I put a king snake in a cage with them, they'll go crazy trying to get out of the cage because they know it's a natural predator. So they're going to avoid them. So if you have them on your property, it's a kind of a, I didn't know that. Wow. yeah, it's an aversion <laughs> thing. And the other thing is like what you're saying with the rat snakes. Well, if you have one predator that's controlling the rodents and you take it away, something's going to take its place. Well, if you're in an area where there's copperheads and there's a place where that rat snake could live, there's going to be a snake come. You know, if you don't want snakes around your house, the best way to do that is keep your grass mowed down keep everything picked up off the ground, no logs, nothing flat from the hiding, no security spots and, you're not, or, and no place for rodents to be, and you're not going to have snakes around. Right. But most people don't do that. And, you know, so it, you have to learn to live with them, you know, together. And I always get offended by all those pictures on the internet, you know, the yeah. big macho guy holding a snake because my skinny little wife can uh, catch mambas. You know, it has nothing to do with being macho. It just means you did something, you know, you're, you killed an innocent animal that did nothing to you. You're not eating it. You know, I, people think because I, I say that I'm against hunting. I'm, I'm a, I hunt and I fish, but I don't trophy hunt. Right. I oh. use what I take. Yeah, you know, that's what I was taught. And, you know, Native American friend of mine always had a saying out west was that, um, you don't kill the first thing you see, you kill the second, because that means there will always be something left. That's the way I talk about edible plants, too. When yep. We teach edible plants if there's only one species of this, even if we know that there's others somewhere else. Right. 
we don't pick it. And we use that as an educational opportunity to say, you know, leave that one alone, let it be seed for the next. Right. Well, it's yeah. just using nature appropriately. And, and you know, nature will, will help you survive if you do that. You know, I got so. the woods mojo. Oh, yeah. If you help the woods, the woods will help yep. you. Yep. So. <laughs> well, Jim, it's been a pleasure. Really appreciate your yeah, expertise. No problem. Um, check out Kentucky Reptile Zoo. I'll make sure I have some links in the video below and in the comments and description below. Uh, you'll see Jim uh, milking snakes for venom research. I highly recommend checking it out and do everything you can to support the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. So thanks again, and come on, join in. Let's learn together.